Hi, everybody. Welcome. This is another episode of The Sip. Um, We are interns here at the California, here, I say here, like we're actually there, but we're, you know, (laughs) quarantined, obviously, at our own homes. But we're interns at the California Academy of Sciences as part of the Summer Systematics Institute. And uh, this is our live show to watch during your coffee breaks. And we talk about science and interview our fellow interns. Um, So yeah, grab your coffee or tea or water in a recycled pickle jar. Yeah, there we go. Cool. I love it. Um, but yeah, my name's Aria, and this is my co-host. Noah, I'm from, I mean, I'm, I'm in New York right now, New York City, and mm-hmm. I go to Queens College, and it's really nice to be here, and we're going to be introducing time soon, so, uh, okay, yeah. can you go ahead, Aria? Oh, yeah. You want to introduce yourself, Tan? Yeah, um, I'm Tan. Uh, I go to UT Austin, and I was born and raised in Austin, Texas. And I'm an intern under Lauren, who's the head of arachnology. And yeah, I'm a human development major, and I'm going to be a senior next year. Yeah, cool. Yeah. yeah. So we'll jump right into questions then. Um, mm-hmm. First of all, if you're a human development major, um, like, can you tell us a little bit about your project you're working on now and how that fits in with your background? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, if you want to pull up the slides, I put some. Yeah, cool. So, um, uh, so with under arachnology, it's basically like spiders and scorpions. Um, but Lauren specifically works with scorpions, and she has a grad student named Aaron Goodman, and he went into Mexico and found um, specifically these species of spiders under this genus, the Centroides. And um, he like scorpions. Hmm? Spiders or scorpions? Sorry, scorpions. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so he basically found the first example of niche partitioning and habitat partitioning inside um, scorpions. Um, and he recorded, you know, like their morphometrics, so their physical characteristics. And then he also took a ton of like genomic data and like data se- DNA sequencing and that kind of stuff. And um, so within like niche partitioning and habitat partitioning, he noticed that these three species um, survived across a range of temperatures and humidities. And specifically um, the Relayi, who survived in like low temps and high humidity, which is the one that you drew actually on <laughs> your graphic that um, you provided so kindly. Um, he noticed that they were really, really tiny and they had super long, super long bodies um comparatively to the other species of scorpions so this summer i'm going to be mapping out the morphometric data and seeing what is statistically significant in terms of um, the shapes of their bodies you know like the length of their tail or the length of their pincers the total length of their body and seeing if it's statistically different from the other types of species and then we're going to be mapping that onto the genomic data and seeing um yeah, like kind of like seeing where that aligns up and like um, where the genomic data reads into the morphometric data. So um, yeah, so like the general gist is just kind of seeing um, niche partitioning both morphometrically and then genomically as well. And then maybe making inference as to why, you know, like um, these spiders are shaped, or sorry, these scorpions are <laughs> differently from like other species and why they ended up living in, you know, the treetops rather than the ground floor. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, cool. That's that's like super super cool. Um, mm-hmm. And I know that we ha- there's a lot of like really like interesting dense topics in there like that kind of stand alone. So actually, mm-hmm. could you first tell us a little bit about what niche partitioning actually is and what it like kind of means for these scorpions yeah. in a little more depth? Yeah. So um, scorpions are actually uh, cannibals. So when they yeah. Yeah. excuse me, <laughs> yeah. So when they yeah. Honor, one of their kind, they'll actually eat each other. So they don't oh. even. Have, they have a competition of you know predators and also competing for prey and a food source, but also they compete within themselves. So I think kind of like niche partitioning kind of happens almost naturally just because there's pressures from a lot of different outside factors and internal factors. So um, maybe like Relay might and have ended up in the treetops because you know they were better able to survive because of like the shapes of their bodies and like their center of gravities were different and allowed them to you know like balance in like the the tree branches and stuff and by being up there where there are less predators and where there are less species of scorpions that can actually exist they're more likely to survive right because there's like less competition 
So I guess like the entire idea of like niche partitioning and habitat partitioning is just kind of finding your place within the ecosystem mm -hmm. so that like you don't have too much competition for both like your meal and you're not in too much like physical danger from other like predators within your own species and outside of your own species. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. I'm still like kind of stuck on the fact that scorpions are quite like <laughs> yeah, that. Like... <laughs> yeah, Lauren told me that too. I was super surprised to find out, but she was I was just kind of asking like, oh why would why would scorpions need to, you know, like escape from each other? She's like, oh, because they eat each other. <laughs> you, just, you just eat each other. I'm like, oh okay, cool. Yeah. And these scorpions are found in southern Mexico, I see on your slide there. Um mm -hmm. but there are scorpions like kind of everywhere, right? There are. Um there scorpions are just found everywhere. It's just um uh Aaron, the grad student, just in his in his research paper that he published, he specifically uh studied these three species because it was the first example and clear like clear cut example of niche partitioning. Um just that there was like a high population of scorpions and he noticed that there were multiple species within the same within the same area but not but somehow not encroaching on each other's territories, right? So, um, yeah. So that's why that's why he chose um, these this like geographical area to study and the species that came with it. And so, um, yeah, I just thought it was I just thought it was pretty cool. Yeah, cool. And that actually seg segues us nicely into our first like official question. Noah, you want to mm -hmm. kick us off there? Yes. What is something that excites you or inspires you the most about this summer research? I am most excited to meet y'all in real life because <laughs> <laughs> we just got we just kind of got word that we might be able to meet each other, and so instead of seeing each other on the Google Meets every single day and mm -hmm. over FaceTime for our Slack Donut meetings, I don't know. I'm super excited just to meet all of you guys because I feel like we've had so many good interactions and just talks especially with like the journal club um just about you know really relevant issues both within like the stem field and um related to what's happening in our world right now i just think our, our group of interns is so great because we actually come from such a rich background or rich um we all come from such like different backgrounds Mm -hmm. But when we come together, when we talk together, um, we're able to give each other like equal equal platforms. I think yeah. that's something we come out. So I'm really excited just like to meet all of you guys, but also just to grow more together. Just because all of our conversations, when we talk about like the different ways that we grew up and, you know, the things that we went through as people of color in STEM, I think it adds like something super valuable to our experience. Yeah. And for those of you watching for some context, we have been in this internship remotely for four weeks now, right? This is week mm -hmm. four we're coming up on. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. And so starting week five, wow, it's literally a week away from today. We're mm -hmm. going to be more together and in the same place, which is very exciting. Um, all safely, of course, with, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like distancing and all right. kinds of measures to make sure that we're all safe and healthy and keeping the people around us safe and healthy. But mm -hmm. yeah, we are also. I, I know I speak for Noah and I want to say we're both super excited. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, um, maybe Han, do you want to tell us a little bit about what it's been like for you working remotely all this time, like <laughs> so far? <laughs> yeah, it's been it's been pretty interesting. Um, so I I have an apartment down at UT in um, West Campus, which is like the area next to campus, and so but up until a few weeks ago, I was working from home, like in my family home. Um, and that was pretty stressful. Um, there's a lot of kids running around and there's a lot happening at home and somehow there's always like a million things to do. And so it was kind of a struggle at the beginning, but like coming down to the apartment and just like being in my own space, it's allowed me to focus a lot more, I'm learning how to program in R and like, you know, learning how to use all those kinds of programs. But it's also been um, interesting. I think my mentor mentioned, I think it was like, screen fatigue or something like that when you're in meetings all day and you're like it's like google me after google me and you have to like maintain your pep almost yeah you like kind of like feel yourself getting kind of like really like tired after a while and like yeah but it's been pretty fun like i mean i think they did a really or like the mentors and the coordinators did such a good job at like making the journal club and then we have like the psychom club and then also just like in our classrooms and stuff i feel like it's super interactive anyways so it's been pretty fun. 
Yeah, definitely. I know doing science and like communication and stuff remotely has been a big <laughs> learning curve yeah. for all of us. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And I feel like doing research when you don't have like easy access to a lab is an entire challenge, but um, mm -hmm. it's it's exciting yeah. to see how everybody's kind of working around it and mm -hmm. finding new avenues to like work on things together. Yes, for sure. Yeah, yeah. that's been great. Mm -hmm. But yeah, here, um, let's hop into our next question. I'm doing a lot of things with my hands today. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, our next question for you is, can you tell us a little bit about maybe one of your favorite memories in nature or like, a, yeah, a favorite memory in nature. That's it, that's the question. <laughs> yeah, um, I actually, that's actually my next two slides. Um, let me control that. So um, one of my favorite places um ever is the rocky mountains um i just grew up going there um and it was a transition from like the floridian beaches to the mountains because that was like my childhood vacation was like going to the florida beaches but eventually my family got older and we were like so tired of like salt water and just like sitting outside and doing nothing tired um, of the ocean <laughs> nah, i yeah. my family just got tired of the ocean as a whole <laughs> We just moved to the mountains and we're like I've I've just been in love with it ever since. Um and so whenever I go, we always stay in the same place. Um it's uh called YMC of the Rockies and it's right next to SS Park and it's right next to like the Rocky Mountain entrance. And I went there all the time um with my family. Um they're actually in the bottom right corner. Um mm -hmm. that, those are all my siblings. Um so we have all yeah, I have five siblings. Oh, awesome. Yeah, so we would always go there and would always hike and stuff. And then once I got to college, you know, like we're able to travel more on our own. And so I began taking like groups of friends there and just being able to show them like all of the all of the hikes that I love so much. And just like, you know, like some of my friends just had never been to like actual like mountain ranges either. It was just so fun to experience that kind of all, all over again, you know, seeing their faces and seeing how beautiful it was. Um, but one of my favorite memories from so this i think most of these pictures are from um last summer and i went with a group of friends and those those top two pictures the ones on the left were my friends planking and then the other one at the bottom <laughs> we actually did this hike on the last i think it was the last day that we could have hiked and we started off to Wesel falls and um i think on our way to Wesel Falls, we saw these thunderstorm clouds and, you know, like thunderstorms like tend to like roll in in the afternoon in the mountains like all the time. And we knew that, but <laughs> we, we like pushed through anyways and we were just like, send it, send it. We should just send it all the way. And so we get finally get to the falls and it's pouring rain and there's lightning and super loud thunder. And we were like, no way, like we already made it up here. So we like, <laughs> so we like climbed up the falls, like my friend took up planking picture that picture over there is like i think it's like a self timer photo and you can't see it but it was like pouring rain on us and then um we were there for a few minutes and then we were like fearing for our lives because at that point the trail was flooding right yeah. we sprinted all the way back i think it was like at least like four or five miles and we just sprinted the entire way back to the car but it was like it was one of my favorite experiences just because like we knew it was gonna happen it was gonna be pretty unfortunate but like you know, nothing's more fun than running for your life. <laughs> like four or five miles. <laughs> yeah, that was that was like one of my favorite memories. Um, but yeah, um, I think I can go to. All right, how do I go to the next? Okay, so oh, and then right after, I think a few days after I got back from Colorado, um, another group of friends and I went to Guatemala, specifically Antigua, mm -hmm. and. Um, it was the most beautiful place I'd ever been. Oh my God, it was so gorgeous. And we went to, um, I think it was called Lake Atitlan. And um, we like kayaked there and it was just so gorgeous because Guatemala has tons and tons of volcanoes active and dormant. And this lake was just surrounded by surrounded by volcanoes. And it was, I mean, like I'd never seen that kind of, I don't, I don't know, like, um, terrain before or even like seen a volcano i don't think like in person and it was just so incredible and um i've been on lots of hikes before but this one was the my first and only overnight hike and oh. it was up um this volcano 
uh, a dormant volcano, not an active one. <laughs> yeah, <I imagine. laughs> it was it was it was crazy because I I was the, I think I was the smallest around the smallest of our group, and the pack like the backpack was like fifty pounds, which was like half of my body weight, and so. I think we, oh my gosh, I think up the mountain, I think it was like maybe 15 miles. I don't remember because we didn't track. But my God, it was like the most mentally strenuous hike of my life because we were just hiking up um, volcanic, like I think it was like volcanic ash. So like you take two steps and you fall down one step because it's so like, oh. it's so loose. So you have to work twice as hard to get up, like for to like to walk half the length of what you normally would. Yeah, kind of like running in sand, right? Yeah, like, it was. Yeah, you just felt like you were walking backwards for like <laughs> 10 hours. Um, but I think the most incredible experience in nature I've ever had was um, we made it to the base camp, and then we mm -hmm. we used summit at like two or three in the morning to make it to the sunrise. And um, while we 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 made it to base camp and we camped, and then the sun went down, and then um, apparently you could see like a volcan a volcano called Fuego and it was actually active um, but we could only hear like the thundering of like the explosions so we like we like couldn't see the lava or anything and then um the sun went down and then out of and then we were just all like hanging out around this fire and then out of nowhere all of the clouds and all of the you know like all of the clouds just blew away and it was just like the clearest night and we saw like the volcano erupting over and over again and it was so incredible and then like that was like to the right and to the, to the left, we could see like the glimmering lights of like a city um, at like down at the base of the volcano. And then at the same time in the center of our view, there was a thunderstorm that was happening like a few miles away. So it was like the most incredible show. Like my friends and I, I remember my best friend and I were just like hugging and crying because it was the most emotional, <laughs> it was the most emotional like, I think we're supposed to go to bed, but I think like we we ran around just looking at the different sites to see for like almost three or four hours. We got like we got like a few hours of sleep, but it was the most incredible experience because yeah, it was just we'd never seen a volcano erupting, and then at the same time a thunderstorm was happening, and at the same time like the lights down below were like flickering out, you know, in and out, and it was just like it was a super surreal experience. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. unreal. Wow. Yeah. yeah. How long were you there? Um, in Guatemala or on the volcano? Guatemala. I was there, oh, not long. I think I was there for maybe a week. I was there for maybe a week. And then we stayed mostly in Antigua, which is, I think is a more of like a touristy town, but it was so beautiful. And everyone was so kind. All the, like every like Guatemalan person that we talked to was so kind and just like so willing to help. It was like such a, it was such a good experience. Yeah, I have to go there. Yeah, it's so it's so gorgeous. It's so pretty there. I really want to go back. But yeah, my hardest hike, hardest hike of my life, <laughs> hardest hike of my life. And um, we had we had a guide going up, and he would tell us, oh my gosh, he would tell us that the guides who are hired to go up and down the mountain, um, their pastime is ultra marathons, which is running a hundred wow. miles. And they like a hundred miles straight, and they would train by running up and down the volcano. So like, what took us like twenty four hours to do, they would do in a matter of like two and a half hours, wearing nothing but like sandals, and they would have like a little like eight ounce Ozarka water bottle, and they would just sprint up and down like the volcano, just like right past us while we were like struggling. <laughs> Not, like nothing. Like it was, they would just breeze past us. They're like full on sprinting. Yeah, wow. yeah. It was a it was an incredible experience. I loved it. Yeah. Going to our next question. Yeah. Okay. How has the Black Lives Matter movement impacted you as a person or, or as a scientist? Right. Um, so there was a lot of protests happening in Austin as well. Um, there's also been a lot of like police brutality cases here too. And um, I, you know, BLM has been a movement for a long, long time, but I think during this quarantine period, like it definitely was a turning point with George Floyd. And at some point, like for me, it made like this turning point made it so apparent that like I I couldn't live in like my kind of own privilege 
of just like acknowledging it but not actually doing anything about it and so like there's this huge shift of like you know people post like lots of graphics and like people will say like it's really oversaturated and like people don't actually mean it but I think like this turning point of like people actually caring and people actually taking the time to educate themselves and myself too it was it was definitely it's definitely been a huge pressure for me to begin learning about my own privilege and begin learning about a lot of different aspects of BLM that I wasn't um, really aware of. And so um, the prison industrial complex is was something that I always knew about, but then, you know, watching documentaries um, that I found and like actually listening to like resources that, that have always been there. It's just like, I was never like pushed to in the way that like, push to listen in the way that I have now. Um, it's just kind of opened my eyes to kind of how deep inequality runs and how deep systemic um, inequalities run. Um, so even like ideas that I've held and accepted as, you know, just like normalized parts of society, such as like the model minority, um, you know, being Vietnamese American, I've always heard about the model minority and I've always been subject to a lot of like stereotypes that come with it. I just learned, or during this time I've learned about how, um, it's a myth and how it's used to perpetuate um, anti-blackness by pitting people of color against each other and pitting, well, first off, I didn't like um, using Asian Americans as a single identity, like a single entity and not like we have, um, like, you know, Vietnamese Americans exist and, you know, Chinese Americans exist and Malaysian people and Thai. And so like mm -hmm. one, like the harm of grouping all of these different, you know, cultures into one entity and one um, American experience, one Asian American experience is harmful in and of itself. And then two, using that kind of like, um, using the, the myth of the model minority to, um, to perpetuate the idea of like pulling yourself up by the bootstraps and comparing that to, you know, um, black people and saying like, oh, if Asian Americans are, you know, one of the most high achieving, but they're also immigrants, why couldn't you do X, Y, Z? And I I was never aware of that because it's always, I mean, like you always like, as a Vietnamese American, I'd always kind of heard about it. I'd always kind of like heard about, um, I just kind of accepted the idea that I was a model minority. And, um, but then like learning to question it and learning like, why does this exist in the first place? And what purpose does it serve? outside of like, you know, saying that like, patting us on the back and saying that like, oh, congrats, like you've made it, you know, into the, this like tax bracket or something. Um, just kind of realizing how like ideas that have been taught for so long actually um, perpetuate the idea of like, you are black people in their, in this place in society because of their own actions and not because of um, complex systems that have already been in place for a long time. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's like that's been that's been one thing that has really opened my eyes of just kind of questioning um, the American education system <laughs> as a whole, everything we've been taught, but also um, just questioning things that have been so normalized and accepted, and actually mm -hmm. thinking about its impact on um, marginalized groups and other marginalized groups. That's definitely yeah. like a huge turning point for me. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. I think, you know, like, as like, diverse Asian Americans in like, you know, the kind of the bigger grouping of like Asian Americans, like, I know that different, like people from different cultural backgrounds are all trying to figure out their like hyphenated American identity. And so like, in that process, I've kind of along the similar lines, I've seen a lot of like, anti blackness, just like from appropriated culture and then being like, yeah, woo, cool. This is us yes. and not yeah. like standing up for the actual, like, I mean, that in itself is kind of like anti-black cause you don't, you know, like yeah. acknowledge where the culture comes from. And yeah. yeah, so I'm super on board. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, <laughs> like, no, that's, really well. yeah that's been like something I've, I've become super aware of. Like I follow a lot of um, Asian American news outlets and, you know, I see overwhelming support in my daily feed from people that I follow, but in like those comment sections, I see there's like a huge divide because in like, you know, like in within like certain Asian American subgroups, there is a lot of anti-blackness. Like we see it in like our parents and our grandparents and that just hasn't been talked about before. But we also see how it's, it's affected a lot of the young people in some Asian American subgroups today. So like when, when 
ideas that are expressed that are pro BLM, um, when I see those, I expect to see like overwhelming support, but then there's a lot of like, oh, well, black people didn't st you know, stand up for us in X, Y, Z situation. And this is why, you know, like, oh, people were silent when like racism was happening for like COVID-19 and like, why didn't they stand up for us then? And I, and it's, and like these kinds of attitudes, like I was just kind of surprised to realize, but they're so prevalent across a lot of like, especially like Vietnamese Americans. I just, I heard a lot of that sentiment more so than I thought actually existed. And so that was, that was pretty surprising. And so that in a way that also drove me to speak out against that as well within like the Asian Americans and Vietnamese Americans that I knew too, because I realized like, it's, it's not as, it's not as supportive as I thought it would be. Yeah. 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 And you know, like, yeah, yeah. I think you said it really well. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for sharing. And I, I think it's, you know, as like people who are also pretty like heavily proportional in sciences, it's like, mm -hmm. it, I think all of what you said translates fully to like, you know, standing up for our black peers in academia, yeah. like other, like underrepresented groups, like, um, in the science that we do. Yeah, and I think like we've, I think it's come up a little bit in our journal club. Like I remember the first one that we had, we had a really long, really long discussion about our different experiences in STEM. And I've, I personally have never, I've never felt like specific discrimination or kind of like questioning uh, my own validity in being there. Um, and I think that also stems a little bit from like model minority and expectations that were given. But I was, it was, it was pretty shocking because we hear about inequalities within STEM, within research labs and within like the publishing of papers and within the uptake of papers. But um, actually hearing about it from our fellow interns, it was like, wow, this is so prevalent. Like it's prevalent, like we're only talking to undergraduates and every single one of them has had experiences in like the labs that they're in or in like a science class that they're in. They've definitely experienced some kind of prejudice against them where they're like, quality of work or their intelligence is questioned. I think that's like a huge issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, uh, let's shift gears a little bit and mm -hmm. move into our last question um, of this live stream. Uh, yeah. Our question for you is, if you could travel anywhere in the universe, um, where would you go and why? So this is, okay, so my answer, <laughs> It's kind of weird. Like it's it's not anywhere in the universe. I wish I could think of like some kind of like nebula to like travel <laughs> to. But um, oh, I actually have like a slide for the last one. Yes. So um, there's this concept called the pole of inaccessibility. Basically, there are like like within like a within like North America, it's the point that's furthest from the ocean, right? So it's like the most landlocked that you can get, and this is in the this is in the South Pole, and um, it's the furthest that you can get from the ocean. So uh, uh, like theoretically, it's the hardest place to travel to, especially also being in like the South Pole. And I think in 1958, like these, um, I think there were these Soviet explorers and scientists that came and they set up this research base on the pole of inaccessibility. And they, they vacated it after I think like 10 days. 10 or 11 days, they were like, nah, this is way too hard. So I think they like survived for 10 days. They had like supplies to last them like six months. And they were like, no, this is too hard. <laughs> and so they abandoned this research station. And of course that's that's a bust of, I think, Lenin on the top because it was Soviet, Soviet um, researchers. And um, I think it, it was like turned to face like Moscow or something. Hmm. And it was abandoned for like decades and then only like four or five expeditions have made it only to visit. They never actually like ended up like actually setting up an active research station there. And then that picture at the bottom is from 2011 after it had been put there in like 1958. And all of like, I mean, like it's such like a changing like terrain with like snow and ice. It's like the, it's like the hard, it's like an impossible place to live in. And so they came and like, surprisingly, the only thing still standing, like the research station had been completely buried except wow. for Lenin that's been there for so long. So like, it's like kind of like a weird, it's kind of a weird place to want to travel to, but just the idea <laughs> of like the most inaccessible place ever in the world where like humans have tried to like go there and set up a place to like, you know, perform research 
and it's 2020 and they still haven't been able to do it <laughs> i just think that'd be pretty i think just think that'd be pretty funny to to end up there and like be the person who says like, i can survive in this negative 70 degree weather like i can survive yeah. like this you know like below freezing temperature <laughs> yeah i love that and like, i mean like could you imagine just going and like using like a giant leaf blower to like get the snow away and like you uncover this gigantic research base like, it's gonna be me like in the most <laughs> with like the most minimal gear like me on like a snow tractor or something <laughs> just trying to plow my way through this base because i have no supplies whatsoever and if a whole like multiple expedition teams couldn't like couldn't survive like what makes me think that like me and like you know like my single backpack is gonna survive here. <laughs> just, like, like, backpack. <laughs> I just like just, like me with like a ski mask or something just like unable to survive but i'm, I'm still trying my best <laughs> i just think the idea is pretty funny i know i don't know if i'll ever actually travel there but it's nice to think about <laughs> Yeah, oh, I love that. And so, wait, sorry, you said this was like furthest away from the ocean, or like what? What did you say about that? Okay. Um. Well, so like you know, like the like um masses of land aren't perfectly circular, right? So like there are mm -hmm. multiple like poles of inaccessibility, and this just happens to be like from this these people's standards, this was where like you were furthest from from land, and so oh, they're like poles of inaccessibility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like there's poles of inaccessibility, like in all like continents like there's a pull of an accessibility like in australia and then in like north america and stuff like that and so like this is just one of the ones that's like nobody is able to nobody is able to get to for some reason yeah <laughs> well, i know the reason but nobody has been able to like actually set up base there yeah yeah okay cool yeah yeah well okay thanks for sharing that i i that's such a fun location um <laughs> But yeah, we um, that's all the questions that we have for today. And uh, those of you watching, um, we have our social media accounts listed right here below, um, both Twitter and Instagram. And we're posting all kinds of content featuring our fellow interns like Tan and more, um, but also all kinds of like science stuff. And you'll learn more about all these interns research projects as they kind of unfold through the rest of the summer. So give us a follow, check it out. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for being our guest of the day. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Thank and you. Thank you. <laughs> Not really. Yeah. All right. For watching. I'll see you in class then. Yeah. <laughs> see y'all. Have, have a great rest of the day. Stay Bye. safe. Bye.